Nerd alert. Dork face. I am not a loser. I just have a bad haircut. Kind of a major dork. Oh, nerds. If you're into science, tech, or unique hobbies, you're listening to the right show on Get Nerdy With It. We interview nerds talking about their passions. This is Get Nerdy With It. This is Get Nerdy With It, episode number two. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jennifer Ruggiero, your host, and with me, Jeff Tickle, our co-host. Hi, Jeff. Hello, everyone. How are you? I'm doing well. <laughs> well, thank you for joining us this week. I'm, I'm happy to have you on the show. Um, so we're going to have a good time. We're talking with Vin Brown from Vintuitive.com. Hey, Vincent. Vin, Vin, you go by Vin, right? Yeah. Okay. I'm Hi, sorry. Jennifer. Hi, Jeff. <laughs> How, How are you doing? How are things going? <laughs> oh, really good. Great. Um, yep. I'm, I- I'm feeling good. I got to say thank you for joining us so early in the morning. I know that you are in Adelaide and we are in North Carolina, actually, on the East Coast. So for us, uh, you know, it's it's a decent hour in there. It's kind of early in the morning. So thank you for, yeah. for getting up early and joining us. Yeah, I've just swiped the, the sleep from my eyes. I've had my Vegemite toast and I'm all set. <laughs> Vegemite. <laughs> Vegemite toast, Vegemite sandwich. Yeah, we've had a lot of discussions about Vegemite before. So, (laughs) So, um, let's just talk a little bit about Vin. He is the uh, a website developer and promotions person, and helps out helps build small businesses and and market with them. And he has an awesome site called Vintuitive.com. And so we just wanted to talk with you about your site and some of the projects that you're involved with, involved in. I see you online. I, I follow Vincent, for, for those of you who don't know. I follow Vin online in, in all social spaces. And he has the best tips and tricks and is so active online with social media. So I, I'm intrigued by everything that you write. Uh, you write so well. And so I'm really happy that you're on the show. So thank you. Oh, um, thank you so much, Jen. You're, you're welcome. So how did you get into it all? How did you start getting into web design? Well, you know, I had to have a think about that because I wasn't quite sure. Um, I, I reckon it started with um, a, a bit of a strange angle, really. Um, I, I was building a garden and I, I was building it on um, principles of sacred geometry. Mm-hmm. And I, I wanted to um, put it all together and I sort of wrote a, wrote a document, but I wanted to share that. And I thought, well, I, how do I make a website? And and that's where it started. I think I built it in um, Microsoft front page. Oh, yes. So it was so old. <laughs> that was where my first site came from, too, front page. Uh, yeah. How about you, Jeff? Oh, boy. Um, yeah, I, I uh, just kind of fell into it some years back, but I've definitely used the front page. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> I think we're dating ourselves here. Yeah, yes. I'd say so. <laughs> yeah. So you just you just taught yourself then, I guess. Uh, yeah, but it's it's uh, it's not right to say I taught myself. It's it's such a rapidly changing industry. It's I, I, you have to keep learning every day, otherwise, what you knew a year ago is no longer really relevant. Um, well, certainly, front page isn't. <laughs> you know, right. a lot a lot's changed since then. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a constantly uh, moving thing, and you've, you've, it's changing so fast that you've got to keep learning. I did do some formal training um, in the way of a cert for a certificate for in programming. I covered some aspects of web design, but but again, that was about ten years ago now, so mm-hmm. a bit outdated. Outdated, yeah. So have you always have you always been into tech? I mean, you're you're. You know, you, you you said you got into web development, I guess, in the 90s. That would be, I think, as far as when Front Page came out. So uh, have you always been interested in technology? Yeah, actually, um, I was thinking back. Um, I, I've, I've always told people, in fact, I think it's on my G Plus profile uh, as, as my bragging rights, um, that the first computer I programmed had no keyboard, I had no mouse. What? I had no script. I didn't even have a screen. Wait, wait. And you? Pro- how did you? <laughs> how did yeah. you program that? <laughs> that? That was back in uh, 1982. 
and that was um, it, it, it was a card reader. So you had this big pile of cards, and you had to get a special two B pencil, I think it was, and you had to do it diagonally across the line. So you know, line ten might have been print uh, my name. So you know, you'd get the pencil and you'd cross across the one, across the zero, and then across the P. And it would take ages just to write one line on on a card. But you'd have a whole stack of cards, and if one of the cards got out of order, or there was a, pe- you'd done the pencil line too much over the zero, or you wow. know, the slightest little error, and, and it's all stuffed up. Um, didn't have a screen. The output was a dot matrix printer. So, you know, once you ran your cards through, it would just spit out the printout. And if there was an error, you'd have to go back to your, to your desk and, you know, work out where the error was and then go back to the computer room and run the cards through again. It was all very tedious and, and, and boring. Wow. You know. wow. But, but it, did, it did spark my interest. But and as I was thinking back, um, actually, it, my first programming experience preceded that because um, I'd bought uh, – the year before, I'd bought a um, – Oh, what's called a, a Dick Smith wizard, which was really uh, back in the 80s. I had those combos where you had like a personal computing had just started and um, they were combining it with the Atari sort of, mm-hmm. you know, t- a TV games that were because the Atari was huge and what was it uh, called? back in then. Dick Smith? Yeah, see, in Australia we have this legend called Dick Smith. He's, <laughs> he's a bit of a philanthropist now and he's, he's lots of things. Oh. Um yeah, actually, on the Vegemite issue, he um, when it sort of <laughs> he, he's he's very big on um, bringing bringing products, you know, bringing the Australian made products back into the fore, um, rather than sort of having all these um, overseas ones. So anyway, he in his early days he was an electronics guy, and he has uh, electronic shops all over Australia, and um, and he brought out a computer, uh, and it was called the Dick Smith Wizard. <laughs> and um, yeah, the, in, the, um, the keyboard was actually made by putting the two paddle controllers together, sort of slotting them into this part, the front of the computer. Oh, wow. And um, yeah, it was really hard to type on. <laughs> but, I, but I would bash out pages and pages or screens and screens and screens of, of, of basic programming code. Wow. Um, and it was good fun. I, you know, I, kn- I haven't even heard of that. I never had. D- Jeff, do you know of that machine? I, I, I am not familiar with the Dick Smith, that's for sure. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I think it was only in Australia. And I think in America, you have, um, the, the, you have a very similar thing, but it's called Activision. Yes. Okay, yes. yeah, yeah, I'm familiar with that. Okay. Well, um, um, yeah, I think he sort of took that and, and remodeled it. And I, I think it was actually called Creative Vision. But. Yeah, that's a long time ago. Um, yeah, it was just an Australia release. So, yeah. Activision, yeah. Uh, Activision used to make all the best games. <laughs> yeah. I remember that. I remember that, yeah. Wow. Yeah, but, but before that, um, I, can, I think my earliest memory with tech would be um, oh, when my father built me a robot. Um, no way. It was always, yeah, yeah, I was about four. Um, he was always building us all sorts of things, mostly out of wood, but, um, he'd put together this robot cause I loved robots from, you know, as early as I can remember. And, um, yeah, it was made out of a biscuit tin and a fishing reel or something. And I just thought, oh, this would be fantastic. I'll, I'll get, I'll get some electricity to it and animate it. And this will be, you know, it'll be just like those robots on start on, on TV on Battlestar Galactica and all that. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And so I was rummaging around in his shed and I found this bit of electrical cord that had, he'd cut off an old TV or something, some old appliance, and, and I just I had these bare wires on one end and a plug on the other, and I thought, oh, this is excellent, this is just what I need. So I plugged it into the wall and, I, and then flicked the switch and I must have had the bare wires in my other hand and it just zapped me. <laughs> and Ouch. Yeah. Ouch. Yeah, it, it hurt a lot. I've still got the big scar on my finger. Um, yeah, and that was my probably my first gadget experience did they well, uh, did you pass out yeah i think i did i, I very nearly died oh my gosh <laughs> but but um i had a few more near misses with electricity after that well there's a but lesson that, to the kids out there you know uh respect electricity <laughs> yeah. oh yeah important to learn that oh man well um 
could you tell us about uh, what you're working on these days, some of your sites and projects you've got going on? Um, yeah. Uh, one I'm working on at the moment is called NBC Foods. It's a local... Um, actually, she's a caterer, just a, a local caterer. And she's developed these products. Um, one is uh, sea salt um, flakes um, that she makes from locally uh, gathered sea salt because she lives uh, on, on the shore, huh. on, on, on the coast, uh, I should say. So sea, and, sea salt flakes. So they're it's yeah. like to put with your to, and food and to, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Uh, she, yeah you can make um, salt and pepper prawns. She has like recipes inside. Um, but they're, they're, I wish I could just show you one. <laughs> the, the, the packaging is beautiful. It's um, she's got salt and pepper as well. So um, salt and pepper shakers. Mm-hmm. Um, she's got about four or five products. So just in the process of um, getting together the e-commerce uh, part of her site, um, implements shopping cart facility. Um, another one is Cape Crawford Tourism, which is an ongoing one I've been very heavily involved in for, for years. Uh, she's just a, a very small-time operator. She basically just runs uh, the tours by herself up in North Queen, uh, Northern Territory. It's a really, really remote part of Australia. Um, at a place called the Lost City, it's these really amazing ancient rocks that are uh, some of the oldest uh, in the world. Wow. And, um, I'd love to see was, that. Yeah, it was an, in, it was an inland sea uh, many, many years ago and just... All of the erosion over the years of all, basically all this salt, uh, sorry, all this sand uh, because of caked together as rocks and the erosion over the years has sort of worn them away to leave these big towering spires and that's why it's been uh, named the Lost City because it actually looks like a, a, a man-made city in some parts. That sounds amazing. Yeah, it is. So, yeah, it's funny that, you know, Australia is such a big place and, and so remote that... Um, so many people don't know about this. They've heard of Ayers Rock or the Bungle Bungles, and um, and they've never heard of the Lost City. So, so it's really exciting to sort of get out and the um, push it out into the social media and and get it out, uh, get people aware of it and visiting there. How do people find you? Let's say these these that you help out a lot of small businesses in the area where you live, but you also have worldwide customers as well, right? So. Yeah. How do you? How do people usually find you? Find uh, find out about your your services? Yeah, well, I, it's funny, but so. Um, is it word of mouth or? I was just going to say word of mouth is. Yeah. I was just going to say social media because social yeah. media is sort of like the modern form of word of mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's it's friends of friends, um, clients who've uh, suggested me to other friends who are looking for a website. Um, people I've met on G Plus, Twitter social um, areas online. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually working really well because I haven't gone, a, gone out and proactively sort of put ads in papers and yellow pages and things. Um, I just sort of keep getting a flow of clients come in. When, once I finish one job, miraculously, another one falls in my lap. Wow. <laughs> it's just been that way for a while, so I've, I've been quite lucky. Yeah, social media is just it's wonderful. It's such an easy way of marketing. I guess you really, though, you have to build that customer base, or, or not the customer base, but the uh, your friends. You have to build your social network. And so it takes, you know, some some effort, of course, and, and you don't just blindly follow people and expect them to follow back. You have to create content and engage. And, you know, so I think you do an excellent job about that, or with that. Can, uh, speaking yeah. of, go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to say that that's... Um it's very tricky in, the, in some of the uh, social media sites have been, well, I guess all of them, have been saturated with insincerity, if I can put it that way. You know, there, there are a lot of people just following you back because you followed them and it's like, oh, reciprocate, yeah. yeah. Um, or, or click the like button. I've engaged with someone. Well, no, you, didn't just, you just clicked on a button. Um, you know, and so... It's 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 hard to make your way th- uh, through that as a newcomer um, to what is real and what's not and and what's spam and 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 what is insincere like clicking, <laughs> um, yeah. So so it's really a matter of developing the connections and relationships, and that's why I see perhaps LinkedIn as more of a 
uh, more of a reputable or I don't know what the word would be. Um, it, it seems to have an air of auth- authenticity that perhaps uh-huh. Facebook or others don't. Yeah, I, I can see that. It's it's you know because you've made the connections in the real world. You know you've had you have to ha- to connect with someone. You have to have had an experience with them. Well, I seem to have a lot of people on there that I've never met, and <laughs> so... <laughs> yeah, I, I do and, get and... some out of the blue requests on the LinkedIn from time to time. Yeah, I know, yeah. and it's sad. It's sad that's um, well, what I... was it about a year ago? LinkedIn went social, and it and it seems to have gone downhill a bit since then. I've I've accepted. A lot of people, and if if I have if I share somebody in common with them, I'll typically accept it, and yeah. you know I'll look at the profile first, and I thought, well, you know, if I'm, maybe I'm helping them build their network, you know, so I, I don't mind doing that at all, and it also helps me build my network, and and so, but you know, I just I like to connect to as many people as I can, and and mm. uh, I just wish I could. Know, there's no way to actually know and engage with each and every one. You can't do that. That's impossible. You know. Well, yeah, that's the way I've kept it though with with LinkedIn is that I I definitely don't accept any um, requests from anyone I don't know or haven't worked with. Um, I get a lot of requests from people that I've met online but not worked with, and I have to say, well, look, it's insincere of me to to accept this because we haven't actually worked together, so I can't. Sorry. Mm-hmm. And that and and having that um, you know s- smarts about you uh, or, or sense of filtering creates a much better uh, network in the end you know like twitter if if you just accept everyone or follow back everyone you end up with um, with a with a dirty stream or you know, one that's not as helpful as oh, it could yeah. be you mm-hmm. know mm-hmm. so that dirty yeah. stream <laughs> I, like that. I like that we'll we'll uh we'll coin that <laughs> i just made that up then i like it heard it here first <laughs> the dirty stream <laughs> Yeah. Dot com. Is it being registered? I don't know. Go check right now. <laughs> I'm on it. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So, which which of the networks do you feel would yield the most return? As you know, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, G Plus, Tumblr. Well, you know. You yeah, think? it's hard to say. I I I tend to um, what well, well, I don't, I'm not sure that focusing on the network is is the right thing. I, I I'd rather focus on a strategy, mm-hmm. um, and and not sort of lock it down onto one network specifically. Um, I know it's hard to say that because really each network's different, and you've sort of got to approach each one differently. Um, I love Twitter. It, it's I just can't stay away from Twitter. It, it's very light and easy, so you can just dip in and out whenever you want. Mm-hmm. Um, I love the the curation ability with the lists. Yeah. Um, a very very heavy user of lists on Twitter. Um, what what tool, it, by the way, do you use to access your Twitter and manage your list? Do you use the web interface, or are you using a third party tool? Well, it's yeah. I, I'm in a bit of a limbo period at the moment because I used to use TweetDeck, mm-hmm. and that's only just recently um, met its demise on the Mac. So I, yeah. So I, I did like that because you could have all the columns and you could, you know, really get a master overview of everything. And if you've got several accounts or several Twitter lists and several saved searches and things, then having that great overview was really good. But um, did get a bit cumbersome too. Uh, but it, I loved the ability to be able to schedule uh, tweets, which which I used quite a bit. Um, some people uh, feel a bit funny about scheduling tweets and. Um, well, but, but, it's kind of nice though when you see, for example, Chris Voss will do that. I'll see a lot of his tweets all throughout the day, you know, and it's I'm constantly reminded that he's there on Twitter, you know. So it's you know I think if you do it the right way, scheduling those tweets or is can be a good thing. That way, it's keeping you actively engaged, and, or not you particularly engaged, but at least your followers see you and they don't forget about you. And, mm. you know. Yeah, and I think that's why some people think it's a little bit um, a bit rude because it's like, well, you're pretending that you're there, but you're not. Well, y- everyone uses different uh, Twitter differently, you know, and so I am a, a fair bit of a broadcaster. I like to find, uh, or I should say a curator, really. I like to find good stuff on the net, and I like to share it with my, my people. 
Um, so, so sometimes I find a lot of stuff and I just think, well, I can't spam my, my followers with all this at once, but it's good content. So I used to go into shed, into TweetDeck and schedule it and say, well, I'll just space this out a bit. So otherwise I'd sit there humanly spamming my, my, <laughs> my fans. So, um, you know, shed, scheduling is, is better in that way because I'm not hammering my fans with all the stuff. Have so, you- um. Uh, I was, I was just, just going to say, I moved ahead. on to onto Twitter, uh-huh. uh, the default Twitter app for the Mac. But unfortunately, it's not good for handling lists. You can't really curate your lists no. with it. No, you can't. So I, I fall back on the web, um, just the web version. Have you tried Buffer? I I just started that, and I was thinking about going pro with that. I'm not sure about list management with it, though. I haven't really played too much with it yet. But that's no, good... no, I haven't. It's a good tool to buffer your tweets so that you can schedule them to come out later, and 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 as well as other things, as you know, also Facebook posts. Uh, and not sure if it does it for G plus or not. I'll have to check and see. But you can buffer it so that it comes out at different times, which is kind of nice. Yeah. Mm. But yeah. So what about Facebook? Do you? I, I don't see you on Facebook, but do you do Facebook pages for your clients? No, um, no, that's the answer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, a, Facebook's a bit of a personal thing, and I find that all my clients generally already have a Facebook account, and they're quite familiar with it and comfortable uh, promoting themselves on Facebook. So I just leave them to that. But most of them um, don't have Twitter, or if they do have it, that it sort of signed up for it and didn't, didn't really understand it or get into it. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I, so I help them with the ones that they, they don't understand that can give value. Um, I see that a lot, where I'll see usernames that are registered with just one tweet. You know, they'll sign up, they'll look at it, they'll tweet once, and then they'll leave their Twitter account alone. I see that a lot. I know. It's, it's something that Twitter needs, well, they are doing something about, but, it, you know, so many times you go to find a do you think, oh, this would be a great Twitter handle and you'd see if it's, someone's got it. And they have, but they haven't tweeted for three years. <laughs> and when they did tweet, they only tweeted once and they've still got an egghead. And, but you can't get it. It's, they don't want it. It's so aggravating. Abandoned it. Yeah. I was trying to get the name of this show, Get Nerdy With It, right? And so instead I had to go with Get Nerdy underscore with it because the person who has Get Nerdy With It has one tweet, never uses the account, and mm. and I even thought about trying to like DM her, but I can't DM this person because she doesn't follow me. I think it's a she, but you know. So I don't know. I don't know, maybe at reply, but I mean, is the person really going to get it? So I, but I was just thinking, hey, would you allow us to? Would you let go of this name, change your name, so I could have the name? And and but I didn't ask her. I just kind of let it be. Yeah, well, if she's abandoned it, chances are she's not going to receive. Not gonna respond. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, that's the thing. I, I have. I don't know why. I, I've had a little trouble getting into Twitter, but most everyone I know is on Facebook. So I've just been where most people would tweet. I I, I post a status update, but every now and then I'll check my Twitter, and uh, there I have a whole list of DMs and that. Uh, replies and whatnot and i'm going oh i need to log in more often and check these things um i'd like to ask you um a, a lot of people around here are small businesses i'm i'm living a kind of a small mountain town where a lot of people dial into the internet a lot of people just don't bother with it um but we have a a university in the middle of town, which is pretty much where all of the web traffic around here goes and comes from. But a lot of the small local businesses have uh, set up Facebook pages for themselves. And I'm just wondering how you, um, you know, have, have you noticed a difference in the importance of, of websites? Um, and and I, I, w- I would say that it's very important that, you know, a, a business have their own website, but it just seems from what I've seen that people are just more interested in the, the easy in that things like Facebook will give them. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, of course I would, I favor a website and I would strongly (laughs) recommend people to get a website. Um, it, it, to me, it's similar, like uh, similar to the old AOL. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people in the old days, 
um, just preferred to have their AOL address. AOL was it was seemed like the AOL address was the more important thing than grabbing a domain name. In fact, um, MTV disc jockey, an old an old ex disc jockey, Adam Curry, um, who you might remember, is it was um, sort of credited as one of the founders of of podcasting. Yep. In fact, I think he's he's known uh, in some circles as the Podfather. <laughs> <laughs> well. Oh, he has he had a funny anecdote where he says um, it's around that time when AOL was big, he was snapping up uh, all sorts of domain names as a lot of people were, and he grabbed the MTV one and he thought, well, I better just check, you know, see maybe if there's some legal thing here if MTV wants it. So he said to MTV, hey, do you want MTV dot com? And they go, no, 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 you know that we got the AOL address. <gasps> and and they just thought that AOL address was so much more important. Oh my god! And put so oh, much wow. focus on it. But then, of course, AOLs died out, and and if you were pushing all your marketing onto AOL address, well, <laughs> you're sort of you're left in in limbo now. So I didn't um, know that about Adam Curry having MTV.com. I wondered if he yeah, actually sold. Weird. Isn't that weird? Did he <laughs> yeah. did he sell it to them, or did he? Since he was working with them, did he just kind of hand it over? I want. Do you know? I'm not sure what happened in the end, but they didn't actually want it. They, they said, no, no, you can have that. And it wasn't until the demise of AOL or as it sort of get less popular that they said, oh, Adam, you, you, you know that domain name you mentioned? Can we have that back? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I don't know really how they, how they got it back. But, um, you know, that just goes to show how, how big the focus was on AOL and how insignificant domain names were or websites were. Um, and I think Facebook is very much like that in, in today's age, as you say, Jeff. A lot of people don't think they need a website and they think they can just get away with a, with a Facebook page. But, um, you know, if you've got your own domain name, you can point that anywhere. Um, you can point it to a website or you can point it to Facebook, you can point it to G+, you can do whatever you like with it. Um, and it doesn't stay, it doesn't, um, it doesn't change. So, you know, it's never going to go away as long as you keep it registered. Um, similar to your ISP address, you know, some people will start off on the internet and they'll, they'll use their ISP address. But if uh, they change ISPs, all of a sudden their business cards and all of that stuff, you know, it's all gone. So right, they've got right. to start from scratch. So, But if they had their own domain name, they could have had my name at mydomainname.com and they can have that forever. I'll and tell you, I, I can't tell you how many people will do And it shocks me. Doesn't it surprise you guys that people will actually – go with you know at their at their domain or not their domain but their internet provider's email address they'll use that oh, you know bell drives me yeah. crazy yeah yeah and i just yeah. and yeah. i'm like you know what if you change internet service providers and you're changing your email address and <laughs> yeah, so it's it's interesting that people opt into it and they they just i guess they don't realize i guess they don't think that way yeah no yeah. no that's right a lot of people just think, oh, this would work for now, and they don't realize yeah. what the implications are when they need to change it down the yeah, track. Yeah, that's true. But, it, you know, I'd argue the same for uh, a Hotmail, Yahoo, Gmail. Uh, they're all third parties. They're all, you know, why would you, why would you invest everything in a third party when you can have it yourself? Oh, it so, drives me crazy when I see a business with a Gmail account. Yep, I'm thinking at too. least get an alias, if nothing else. Yeah, and they've got <laughs> their own domain name. They've actually got a domain name, but then, then, then they're using a Gmail account. It looks so unprofessional. So. I mean, what about this one? So I'm using, you know, I have Jennifer at getnerdywithit.com is my email address. But I'm using Google Apps, right? So mm. I'm using the Gmail interface. Are you cool yep. with that? You think that's Yeah, well, you've right? got, yeah, you've got the best of both worlds. That's yeah. exactly what you've done. You've got yeah. your domain name, but you've just pointed it at a third-party um, mail service. And that's, that's exactly um, what you should do. Yeah. Um, because you, you, you know that um, email address that get nerdy with it's going to be there for as long as you keep registering that domain that name. Domain name, yeah, yeah, good tip, good tip. And yeah, and Jeff, I and you know what you had mentioned about the Facebook pages, I see that all the time. Where mm -hmm. here's a pizza place and a neighborhood pizza place that has, um, you know, their Facebook page, but they didn't actually launch a, a, a real website. And I think that's a big miss uh, for these these locations, these small businesses. <laughs> But it's yeah. cheap and it's easy, and a lot of businesses don't really understand the um, the importance of of having um, something online. You know, they just think, oh, yes, people say they've got to be online. Oh, I'll just start up a Facebook page, and you know, um, not not realize the the importance of it. 
So, fellow web nerds, if you see all of these uh, businesses on Facebook, there's your opportunity to start your small business. <laughs> yeah, you're right. That's a perfect opportunity. Just reach out to them. <laughs> Say, hey, I noticed you didn't have a website and you have a Facebook page. I can help you out with this with a new website. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in fact, um, you'd think that that's what I'd be doing and that would be the most of my clients. But actually, a lot of my clients are people who have got a website, but it was made in the late 90s or early 2000s and, and it's really old and it's static. It's an old HTML site and it's, and it's really small, you know, because it's back in the old days, you know, you had these small screens. So um, there's a lot of need to n now just sort of revamp your site and move up, um, move up to, the, to the next level. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Definitely, definitely. Big so opportunities. And, and it's funny because those old websites designed for smaller screens, I wonder if they actually uh, look half decent on a mobile device. <laughs> Good point. Probably not, mm. but... Uh, <laughs> That's a good point. You're right. They were all built for the smaller... Yeah, you're right. Because if you look at the old websites, they're all narrow, right? And they're... Yeah, it's... Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Definitely a lot different. So, And they probably do not look great on a device. <laughs> so, so speaking of which, actually, Jeff, you had mentioned this about a responsive CSS. Sure. Um, yeah. Um... Yeah, I've we, I've been working with with responsive CSS a lot lately, and I know that there's uh, every single article on the internet that will tell you that either responsive CSS is the way to go, or or having a separate site that you redirect to, like m dot your site dot com, uh, that's specially designed for a mobile device. Uh, Vin, I'm wondering how you feel about this, and and if you've done some responsive design or separate websites, how, how you integrate that in your business. Yeah, it's a it's a good question. A nice segue too. It's, <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, responsive design. It's it's a really popular catchphrase these days. Um, w you know, because of the trend towards mobile and the sure. smaller screens. But funnily enough, when I started designing, uh, responsive design was a huge thing back in the old days as well. Because you had a lot a lot of the old screens were like eight hundred pix uh, pixels wide which is really small by today's standard, or even some of them were 640. Um, oh, I had one but of at the same, <laughs> Yeah, but, but at the same time, remember, you had the 1,024 or even 1,200 um, monitors uh, around at the same time. So, And for a long time, I know my mum, she stayed on her 800 monitor for years. And um, so as a designer, you had to cater for, for all of these different screen widths, and you either had to make a fixed one that was small that fit on all of them or you made one that was responsive and changed hmm. uh, with, with the screen sizes. Good point. So it's funny that it's come, come full circle almost back to that point where we're, everyone's uh, focusing on, on making a, a website that's responsive to, to the screen size. But it's only so far you can push that, I, I feel. Um, and then there is sort of two very opposed camps on, on this topic um, for and against responsive design but I think there's a place for both and um, I do think responsive design is great for uh, down to about the size of an iPad but when you get to the size of an iPhone uh, the screen is really thin and mm -hmm. uh, you know the text is shrunk down a bit and uh, buttons have become a little bit too small um, yeah, so at, at that point, I tend to um, go for uh, more of a a different approach and with um, producing like a, a special mobile uh, site. It doesn't redirect to a different address. It just recognizes that you're using an iPhone or a smaller screen and then delivers um, the content for that device. So no one's going, you know, the visitor doesn't know any different. Uh, they don't have to do anything different, differently. But um, the, the size of the images, for example, this is one benefit to doing it this way, is that the, the sizes of the images that you want for a desktop screen are way different to the ones you want on a, a little mobile screen. So mm -hmm. instead, sure. of, instead of having them come down and then be resized, which is what happens with the res responsive design, y you can have them resized on the server side and deliver only 
the small sized images that you need, um, at speeding up the load time and having a better mobile experience for the user. Yeah, I guess the, the extra bandwidth spent on those megapixel images and the extra CSS for the, the uh, media queries, that makes a lot of sense. Mm. So I have a question, though, about having a separate mobile website. So when you, and this is just, I've never created one myself, right? So I, I currently use the responsive design with the, the site that I have now. So yep. if by creating a separate one, the end user, when they're navigating to, let's say it's intuitive.com, uh, and they're yep. navigating, to, navigating to that on their device, it will recognize that it's using a mobile device and just automatically pop over to the mobile Website, yeah. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. That. Why don't you try it? Lo- load up Intuitive on your iPhone, and then load it up on your iPad or desktop, and you'll see two different versions of the of the site. Okay. Yeah. Um, I've I've kept it the same as the desktop for the iPad because I think the iPad is just just a nice size to be able to pre- to keep that same desktop presentation. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I agree. Yeah, but at the, at the size of an iPhone, it's really too small. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's interesting. That's good. I, so it's the it's the the content management, the server side. You're not sending them somewhere else. You're just saying, no. oh, I see your user agents and iPhone, so I'm going to send you different yes. data that's more appropriate. I got it. Yeah, that's pretty cool. No, that is cool. I wouldn't even know about how to how to even create that. Honestly, I just I have no idea. I, I would have to a- ask you, Vincent, and hire you. I was just going to suggest that. Yeah. <laughs> so, yep. So, yeah. w- what other types of projects are you working on these days? I, I saw on your site you have something called a QR cube, and I'm curious to hear more about that and, and tell tell us what it does and what the idea is. Yeah, well, the QR cube it's it's my new. Uh, Vinvention. <laughs> I, 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 when we were when we were talking about um, my early days of the robots and things, and when as a child, I was always making things. Um, uh, one of them I, I wanted to tell you about was this uh, radio watch that I made. Um, you know when you get the old digital watches and you flip the back off to replace the battery, and underneath that metal cap was a as a small metal disc with two wires on it. That was actually the the speaker. You know, so when your alarm went off, you would. It, Beep, beep, beep. It would yeah. actually go through this. There were that tiny little thing. It's just like as, as thin as a piece of paper mm-hmm. for anyone who hasn't pulled apart a digital watch. And so all I did was just cut those two wires off, um, thread them out through. Uh, I took one of the buttons off the, the side of the watch, threaded the wires through that and ran them up my sleeve because I was wearing a long sleeve. And I put a transistor radio in my back pocket, connected the speaker up to that. And went over to my friend's house and I said, yeah. He goes, what are you doing? Because he saw me with my, uh, my, ear, uh, my wrist to my ear. And he goes, I said, oh, I'll just listen to my, my new Vinvention. It's my new radio watch. Vinvention. And he goes, what? <laughs> <laughs> and he goes, what? What are you talking about? So I, I put it up to his ear. I go, yeah, check it out. He goes, wow, that's amazing. But I didn't tell him I had a radio in my back pocket. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I'd somehow invented this amazing radio in a watch. How did you get it so small? Um, you never told him? No. <laughs> oh, I think he found out eventually. But I ended up um, progressing and putting, a, you know, the walkie-talkies were huge in, in the 80s. And so I just got a walkie-talkie and did the same thing. I, put, I took the speaker off and put it in my pocket and connected it with a wire the same way. And I was able to, to, to use my, well, That's I didn't actually get the speaker, the, the microphone part hooked up because it was just a speaker. But I was on my way there. <laughs> and so then my, the iWatch, you know, the iWatch is almost the same sort of thing, except you they know, stole your invention. You, they stole yeah. the invention. Oh my gosh! <laughs> so yeah, so then then the new invention is the QR cube, and um, you know, QR QR codes. Oh, I think everyone knows what they are, but it's basically a two dimensional barcode. It looks like a crossword puzzle. And they're really quite ugly. Um, and they were a bit of ahead of their time because they came out, oh, when was it, about eight, six, six or eight years ago. Mm-hmm. And um, it preceded the iPhone and, and, and the explosion of handheld devices. So um, they, did, they didn't really have a, 
have a use. But now with everyone having a phone in their hand, in their pocket, um, they can easily scan the codes and, and we can see now that uh, they're appearing on all advertising and marketing materials again. Right. Um, even see them on billboards and things on the you on do. the side of the road. You see them everywhere now. Yeah, well, yeah but they're still. What Pardon? Time? I said that can't be safe. Putting it on a billboard. <laughs> <laughs> you take out the phone. And <laughs> you know, I saw I saw that online recently, and someone said the same thing, and I thought, well, yeah, but it's probably in a place where there's lots of traffic jams, you know, and the people are just standing sitting there with nothing to do, and they yeah. think, oh. Billboards, QR code, okay. but now. they're still they're still very um, machine like. You know, they're not very human. So um, one of the ideas was to put put the uh, logo or an image of what the QR code is linking to, in, embed that image somehow within the code the QR code itself, so that a human can look at that QR code and know where it's going to take them to before they scan it. Um, so things, like that. So, yeah. So for example, if one of the QR codes links to your Twitter account, I've put a Twitter logo on that QR code so that people can see that. That's where it's going to go. That's smart. I like that. Yeah. Line. Well, a lot of people are a little bit dubious of QR codes because they think, well, is this going to link me to some dodgy website that I don't know where I'm going? And you know, it's it's a bit of an unknown where this site, uh, where this is going to take you. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, but the other aspect that is being the weakness is just that you've got this thing, and maybe I'll point my phone at it, but really, who, yeah. who knows what it's linking to? You yeah. never know. It's like when you get a link in a tweet or something, or yeah. some random link, and you just say, hey, click this. No, you know, I mean, bit.ly, no thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah, so, but the other aspect is that, of course, is of course to make a cube out of it. So I've created. Uh, a cube that has six QR codes on each of the side, or one on each side. Um, and the great thing about that is that it brings, it's like a business card, but it's three-dimensional. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it brings the internet into the physical world, or the physical world into the internet. Uh, it creates a bridge between the two. But you all, you know, when you give someone a uh, business card, or when you receive a business card, it's often got Maybe their web address, maybe their Facebook account, maybe their Twitter or, or some links or even an email address. The thing is, though, you've got to then pull out your phone and either take a photo of that and send it to Evernote, which is, which is pretty handy to do. But, you know, a lot of people would get their thumbs and start typing out the address. Now, how do I get uh, What's that? Was that a – and the bag of mistake and backspace. And this just overrides all that. You just pull out your cube, you point your phone at it, and then you've gone to their website or you, you've um, gone to their Twitter page, or you've liked their Facebook page, or you've signed in on Foursquare, um, yeah. or you've, you know, you can even start a, a Skype phone call just by scanning one of them. Oh yeah, call us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so on my, I've made one for Vintuitive, and it's got um, all my social networks around the sides. And the logo on the front, so one of the one of the six faces of the cube is not used for a QR cube. It's just as branding, so it's very visible and very noticeably a uh, Ventuative QR cube. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of them for Skype, so they can contact me. You can send it to an email address. You can send it to like a little business card that you can make up so that it has all of the links, the social links on all on one QR cube, uh, code. You can have menus for restaurants um, yeah. popping up. That's cool. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so one of them, I've got a really great local pub that I, I eat at probably once a fortnight, once a month. And um, oh, I just love them so much. I want to create a, a QR cube for them with their menus on it so that they, you know, one for the drinks menu, one for the uh, bar menu, one for the bistro, just to have um, all of these options on a cube to be able to, to you know, f- f- imagine one on, on every desk, uh, on every table in the restaurant. It'd be a real conversational piece, and especially if they're made of paper, which uh, currently these ones are made from from just uh, printed outs. So you can print it out, fold it up yourself. And then because they're so cheap to do that way, you know, you can afford to just sort of throw them all around and, um, yeah. and, and even give them away. Well, I was thinking for a restaurant, I, you know, I'd love to have something like that so that when I want to order takeout, for example, I can just scan it and 
have the menu directly on my phone and then another side scan and call them, you know, or just if that'd be really handy just to have that around. And, and it's distinctive too, you know, having a cube that you can play around with. It's not, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a conversation piece yeah. for sure. And business cards, they just, they get easily misplaced or thrown away, you know, so something like that, it's, you're not going to really misplace it. You know, so. Oops. And I'm making, making one for the NBC Foods client I told you about. Oh, yeah. um, so the idea was, I thought, well, if we could have um, one of the sides of a cube go to a menu or several of, of the sides go to different menus, then, then someone could have this in, in their kitchen with their iPad because a lot of people, uh, I, I certainly use my iPad in the kitchen all the time. Mm-hmm. Pretty much every meal, it's there with me. But, um, you know, you, you don't want to touch the screen. So to be able to just show a QR cube to your iPad in the kitchen and say, here, now go to this recipe because I want to make the salt and pepper prawns, um, you can do that without touching your iPad. Yeah, I like that. That's really clever. It's it's uh, definitely unique too, you know. It's just you haven't seen that out there, and a lot of people aren't. You, you're right. It's like I think more techies will scan a QR cube, but not so many other people. You know, I don't see my parents taking out their devices and scanning QR cubes, or not QR cube. I'm sorry, QR codes. But if there yeah. were a cube, I think it's gonna and with so, something on there that would tell what you're scanning and exactly yeah, yeah that would make it more fun and and actually have i guess have more usage i would think so hmm. i tell you the first time i saw it all, all i could think was i want to roll this and you know like a dice and, nice. and use the uh whatever whatever comes up on top that's the one that wins awesome <laughs> i like it that, that'd be a fun game yeah, I know. That's actually that's the first thing I did was I had my iPad and I set it up on a stand and I just rolled the cube underneath it um, to randomly say, oh, okay, well, what's it going to do? And it would stop on whatever and and then just bring up the G plus page or the Twitter page. That's but awesome. no, it's a good point you raise because um, I I actually have two goals for this at the moment. I'm just doing the paper ones uh, and in and thick glossy card as well. But I'm also in the process of um, getting these manufactured as dice, as small plastic dice, um, so that it's a more durable thing, something that is smaller as well, uh, and something that would last. Because these paper ones, uh, in in the kitchen use that I told you about, are not going to last long. Yeah. Pick up a paper cube with wet hands, and it's just going to turn to paper mache. So, <laughs> yeah, it, it, you you really do need a, a plastic one as well in some circumstances. So. Well. I look forward to seeing those. Thank you. Yeah, so if people want to order them, they can just go to your website and reach out to you there, I guess, right? They certainly can. They can go straight to vintuitive.com okay. and contact me through the contact page then. Cool, yeah. So that that's definitely very unique. So I like – I could see you taking those to trade shows and, yeah. you know, so – yeah, you know, as soon as I posted that, because um, I, I wrote a blog post on, on Vintuitive about it, and you can go and read more all about the QR Cube if you want to um, at Vintuitive.com. But have I put in enough plugs yet for Vintuitive.com? <laughs> <laughs> so what, what's, you have a website. What's your site? It's, uh, V-I-N-T-U-I-T-I-V-E.com. <laughs> And if you Is go to the contact page, <laughs> yeah, that's, Sorry. It's, like, it's like the word intuitive, but with a V on the beginning. Are there some are, are there vin, vin, uh, inventions on there? Vin, no, I can't even say the word. I was going to say Invention? in, inventions. I said inventions. Yeah, or you have some inventions on there too. Yeah. No, there will be some more coming though. Um, <laughs> yeah, you can guarantee it. I've got a new thing also in the pipeline, which I I probably shouldn't talk about in case I don't get around to it. But no, it's it's going to be great. It's called Keyboard Kung Fu. I've already started one of them. Oh, that sounds the interesting idea... already. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, sort of like Ninjutsu for the computer. But no, you know, have you ever uh, – back in the old days when I first started the computer, my, my more techie guys, my friends would say, hey, you've got to learn the keyboard shortcuts. Here's a printout. Put this next to your computer and you'll learn these. They'll save you so much time. Mm-hmm. And I did that, but I never learned. It took me years just to learn Control-C and Control-V and right. just, the, just the standards. Me too. Um, but they do, obviously. Contri- they, they sh- the keyboard shortcuts really uh, make your life a lot easier if you do learn them. Um, 
but I have trouble remembering things, and um, I find that there are certain techniques for memorizing things that that are more um, advantageous or more helpful than others. And and one of them is using visual uh, cues like flashcards. And so rather than seeing just you know the command and C a, a written on a on a screen, I've actually taken a photo of my hand on the keyboard doing it. Oh, so that you know when. Yeah, well, when you see when when you see the image in your mind, it, it just sort of sticks in your mind, and you can see where the location of your fingers are on the keyboard. You don't really have to remember the key, or well, it just helps remembering. So some of them are really uh, quite dexterous, especially on the Mac. Mm-hmm. You know, you've got to hold like three, three or four down at once. And how are you taking the photo of your? <laughs> <laughs> well. It's not easy, but I, I use one hand to take it and one hand to do the shortcut. Yeah. Sometimes, yeah, when I move into the two-handed ones, that's going to be even trickier. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> yeah, keyboard kung fu. I just, I just like the term and I thought, yeah. That's so, clever. Yeah, I like that. I like that. So, so you're going to have the photos there and then I guess people can print out the photo and put it out there? Or? Yeah, but I was thinking of just doing a flicker set or maybe even a slide share. Set. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, because I've have done some uh, flashcards on SlideShare before. It works pretty well. Works pretty well on YouTube and Flickr as well. Um, yeah. So 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 people can just go through and uh, I imagine that when I've got say ten of them or a number of them, you watch the slideshow every day for a few days and you probably memorize them. Mm-hmm. Speaking of which, not to get off on a tangent, but how do you guys like the new Flickr? Well, <laughs> it's, it looks really nice, but I was shocked when I went and read the forums. Have you had a look at some of the feedback? I caught your post saying that some of the feedback wasn't too positive. I went through the whole page and there was hundreds and hundreds of pages and pages and I didn't see a single positive comment. That's odd. I actually, I think the interface is really beautiful. I don't have any complaints at all. Except for the fact that I have a pro membership and that there's, you know, it, I don't really quite see. There's definitely a benefit in having the pro membership. You have unlimited space, no ads. You can see your stats. Stats. Yeah, yeah. the stats is nice, you know. So so there are some benefits. And, and the nice thing is, though, is that they actually are giving people refunds if they want to cancel their pro and go to free. They're giving oh. refunds. Yeah, a, f- a friend of mine just got a refund. So it's a, it's a prorated refund, but still. So the option is there if people want to go to the free account. So that's nice that they, that they gave that option. I think they're doing all the right steps, and, and I think the interface is just beautiful. I need to get some of my photos more in order. I have about 7,000 up, which fails in comparison to some people. I, I, <laughs> so, um, But I need to... Really put them in collections and sets, and that I love it. Well, that that was one of the complaints was the the collections are not um, there's no tab for collections. Oh. Like you've got photo stream sets and favorites, but um, collections are gone. So it's a bit tricky to get to find how to get to those if you even if you can. I'm I'm not sure. Hmm. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's very new and it looks really uh, fresh and and looks really nice. But, yeah, I am a little bit concerned about the functionality. Um, I don't know if they've changed it. Uh, it seems to have a little bit of um, the old Flickr. Uh, it, like I say, I don't know if they, they went back on, on the new design after the, um, all of the opposition was voiced. But there was a comment about um, well, about the description and the comments associated with each photo that they would, it was difficult to get to that. And coming back today or yesterday, I went back and had a look, and I find that there's no problem at all. The comments are there; they're underneath. And I wondered if they had um, sort of, you know, uh, gone back and sort of merged a bit of the old Flickr with the new. Oh, maybe they did. Maybe they listened to the comments and, mm. and changed things. Because if you scroll down, if you scroll down after, after like open one photo and scroll down, the bottom half of the page looks exactly like the old Flickr. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah, Interesting. which is good. I mean, that's good if they've done that. I mean, yeah. Because it means they are listening to the community and they want to want to please everyone. Yeah, and they're responsive. Do you use but, Flickr, Jeff, at all? Have you gotten into I, it? I actually haven't. The one thing I have heard from my photographer friends is they've just simply been very excited about the terabyte. Mm. 
Um, but uh, actually, when when I heard the news, I, I have a bunch of pictures. I've I've not actually. Um, I've just never really used one of these photo sites before, mm. and uh, I don't know, I'm gonna have to give it a try. Yeah, yeah, you should definitely. Yeah, now that you have a terabyte of space for a free account. Plenty of room. <laughs> Plenty of room, and it's a real robust system. They they do a really nice job with it. So. There's no limitation on the number of photos, is there? No. Mm-mm. Okay. Yeah. And then for the pro account, it's unlimited all around. Yeah. Yeah. But you cannot get in a, a new pro account. Uh, they're going to have a what they call it, double double yeah double something two terabytes yeah where you can get two terabytes but for, you... for something like five hundred dollars a year or something was it no was it that it was it was a lot of money and they were saying that no no this isn't for anyone this is for you know high level professional people um, and it's expected that those people will help pay for the <laughs> for, the, for the terabyte you know because no one's yeah. going to use a terabyte anyway so you know uh, Craig Ship from Hangout10.com, Craig Ship, he has yep. like several hundred thousand Flickr photos. Um, I think that's what he said. Something, wow. it was some ridiculous amount. It was, wow. it was a lot. Yeah, and he he uploads about a thousand pictures a month, and so he Jeez. so he really uses it a lot. So for him, you know, I, I would say, I, you know, I'm not. I'm curious how much space he's using right now with the account, but. One thing that I did read was that with the pro, if you do have a, an existing pro membership, you can opt in right now to extend it further so you won't lose that pro those pro benefits. So if you are somebody who uses more than a terabyte of space and you want to keep your pro, it's good to upgrade or to extend the membership now while you still have the membership before it expires. So that's, ah. that is what I heard. And Good, good tip. Yeah, and I am sorry. Excuse me. Just I, you probably did not hear that a hangout was coming through, and I had to ignore it. Okay. <laughs> I so, thought I had something. Did you hear the do 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 do? Yeah. Very funny. <laughs> so. Yeah, but but Flickr, I I love Flickr. I think it's great, and one of the best things about it is the Creative Commons component. Um, oh yes. Because. You know that allows people to um, to share their photos, and and it's a great. Um, well, I was going to say it's a great antidote to to the copyright problem because you know everyone is taking photos left, right, and center, and and um, Flickr allows you to take them and use them legally. You know, just um, using the search search for Creative Commons photos only. Um, this is my blogging tip. If you are a blogger, it's always good to keep photos, use photos in your blog posts, even on G+. So go to Flickr, use the search, search only for Creative Commons licensed photos, and then when you get the results, choose the photo you want, and just be sure to attribute the um, owner or the creator of the of the photo properly so that you just, all you need to know about that is how the licenses work. And there's five different licenses Go to creativecommons.com and read up about them. Take a, a half an hour to learn about the system. And then all you need to do is uh, accredit the, the owner of the photo and a link to Creative Commons license to tell people um, what the uh, permissions on that photo are. And, um, and you can use it legally and legitimately. And it's great that Flickr have built all that into the, the Flickr server so that the moment you upload a picture, you can uh, determine, uh, designate where, what, what license you want to put on it. And I put all on my, li- uh, every photo I upload basically has the most open Creative Commons license I can give it because I want to encourage people to use it. That's wonderful. That is- yeah, but, but it's, not, it's not just like some lovely gesture on my behalf. I'm actually wanting them to use it because they are going to have to attribute it to me, which means they're going to advertise for me. Yeah, that's right. So it will link back to you. Yeah. Yeah. And so and by giving the photos hurt. away. Sorry? Oh, I was, it does not hurt to have a whole bunch of people linking to your site at all. <laughs> no, no. Not it's quite all. a good thing. <laughs> That's a great tip. That's a really good tip. You know, I had not thought about, you know, I'll, I'll look for photos and stuff from my G plus posts, but it's usually linking back to the site or it's a screenshot of the site I'm talking about, you know, so it's that kind of stuff. 
But yeah. uh, to actually use the Creative Commons, that is a wonderful idea. I'm going to start doing that. You'll have a look at some of my um, photos that I do post on G+, and you'll see uh, when I've used someone else's photo that you'll see the attribution and the link to Creative Commons. Um, it's a very simple thing to do. Okay, I'll, I'll be aware of that. And your G plus page is Vintuitive.com plus G. No, G plus. Slash G plus. Slash yeah. G plus. Vintuitive.com slash G plus. Okay. All right, cool. Or you can just use the G plus uh, icon there on the, on the top right. On the site. Okay. Very good. Well, any other questions, Jeff, for Vincent? Um, I... On on the topic of of Creative Commons and and such, what um, do you get to use a lot of uh, free open source software in in your normal day to day work? Uh, yeah, that's that's a question I wasn't prepared for. I apologize. Um, I just thought no, no, that. <laughs> no. No, it's just that um, I guess I do, but I don't think I don't think about it when I use it. What which which is free and open, and which isn't. Um, I guess I could name a couple. GIMP is a pretty good um, image editing piece of software that is open source. Have you heard of GIMP? I, I have. have. It's unusual to hear a Mac person talk about GIMP. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Um, what else? Uh, well, I actually use in my, in my professional uh, day-to-day use of WordPress. WordPress is an open source um, platform. And well supported by the community. It's, um, I think there's like one in, I just don't remember what the last stats were. I think it's like one in five websites in the, in the, in the world are, uh, WordPress based. Um, so yeah. I, what about, uh, let's see, Audacity, that's open source too, right? Yep. 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 That's another good one. It is. Yeah. Uh, Is that what you use? No, <laughs> I, I, I uh, actually I'm using Audio Hijack Pro, and then I also use um, GarageBand. I sometimes, but I've been using Amadeus Amadeus Pro oh, yeah. yep. for audio editing. So that's pretty much what I use. But I have had, I have used before I purchased these two. I used Audacity, and then I decided to to purchase some others. But nothing wrong with Audacity; it was great. Oh, and my, one of my favorites, uh, Handbrake. Is that open source or no? Yes, it is. It is. Oh, I love Handbrake. Handbrake's excellent. Yeah. So Handbrake for DVD ripping, yes. And not for illegal DVD ripping necessarily. <laughs> you Always going to have a digital copy. <laughs> exactly. When you buy media, <laughs> you don't want to have to put the DVD in every time because you want to access it on all of your devices, right? So mm-hmm. why would you – that's my one pet peeve. It's like if I actually get a DVD, I want to watch it everywhere. I don't want to watch it just on my DVD player. So I'll riff it, and then I'll use something called Air Video, and it'll broadcast to my other devices. So anyway, we're getting off on a tangent. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, anything else that you'd like to share, Vincent? Uh, no, I think we've covered – Pretty much everything. I think we're approaching about an hour, so I thought we'd we'd wind down. Jeff, how about you? Any other questions? I'm feeling pretty good. All right, awesome. Well, let's go around, Vincent. If you can, I know you've plugged your site already a lot of times, but if you can <laughs> tell everyone where people can find you online. Okay. Well, if you just type in Vintuitive into your favorite search engine, you'll get all of my social networks and places to find me there. Or if you just go to YouTube, Twitter, Flickr, all the places, type in Vintuitive, you'll find me there too. Excellent, excellent. And Jeff, how about you? Where can we find you online? I have an, a very poorly updated website at jefftickle.com. Uh, I'm also on Twitter at jtickle. Uh, Facebook, aren't many Jeff Tickles out there, and you can Google me up. And you're on G Plus too. I, I am on G Plus. Yeah, so I'll tag you in the in the get nerdy with the post <laughs> great <laughs> and for me jennifer ruggiero you can find me at jennifer all my social links are on there and be sure to follow get nerdy with it on well we're at get nerdy with it.com we have all of our social links there we're also at facebook.com slash get nerdy with it we're on g plus and twitter so be sure to follow us and thanks for getting nerdy with us vincent have a good day thanks jeff thanks jen 
Thanks, Thank guys. you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Get Nerdy With It. Join us each week as we interview nerds talking about their passions. Oh, nerds. And be sure to visit us at GetNerdyWithIt.com. Get